Um, it's a treat, as I said before, to be here. Uh, um, anyway, you may have gathered that investigative reporting is sort of an odd line of work. Uh, that would be an understatement. Um, uh, in most newsroom, uh, an investigative reporter is in, historically was the one in the back corner surrounded by papers and you couldn't actually see the journalist. <laughs> and they, it was like a groundhog. They would come out occasionally. Uh, but anyway, I'm, I'm joking, but not entirely. Uh, uh, <laughs> anyway, uh, I, so anyway, I've been doing this work for, I guess I could just come out of here. It's a little scary back there. Um, uh, I've been doing this stuff for uh, a long time, it turns out. Uh, I don't know how that happened, but uh, it seems like it might be 35 years. Uh, and journalists in particular, not just journalists, not just journalists, but journalists who cover things day to day, that's obviously a vital function. Just watching those in power and what they do obviously is necessary for all of us. Uh, an investigative reporter uh, has some sort of tick, or some sort of DNA issue, because <laughs> they look at what they've just been told and they, they something bothers them. They notice there's something they didn't hear or they should have heard or there's something they did hear that didn't sound right. And then they're like a dog with a bone. They're going to find out what the hell that was. And uh, it could take days, weeks, months. Uh, that's not the conventions of most newsrooms. And even in the good old days, uh, whenever that was, if you find out, let me know. And, uh, this, <laughs> Uh, the, uh, you know, during Watergate and back in those, those years, back when it was seen as a golden age uh, period. And that's a long conversation about the history of this kind of journalism. But watching those in power, of course, goes back to the beginning of this country, even before it was a country. We, we had journalists in this country in the 1730s criticizing the king and being prosecuted. Uh, and it, we didn't call it investigative reporting. They didn't even really have newspapers back then. They were like a little one or two page broadsheets after the ships came in with news from Europe, and they would rewrite it essentially or do other similar things. But uh, it, it changed over time. The golden age of the muck, the first golden age generally would be the, probably that period right before World War One, the Lincoln Stephens and Ida Corbell going after uh, Standard Oil and not Nellie Bly going into a, a mental a, a ward in asylum uh, undercover. Uh, David Phillips, who, who did a story called The Treason of the Senate, noticing all the U.S. senators were actually chosen in state legislatures. Um, and that became a constitutional amendment to have a direct election of U.S. senators for the concept. And, uh, <laughs> and you know, uh, women's suffrage, the, uh, Elizabeth Stanton and and others uh, were journalists for a time with their own newsletter. Frederick Douglass had a newsletter that talked about civil rights issues, so, uh, using probably a slightly different language, but it was the same issue about race issues in America. Uh, Ralph Nader, uh, first thing he ever did that was noticed in America happened to be 1959 when he wrote an article in The Nation uh, about this, this car called the Corvair. And it's a little problem uh, <laughs> that people were dying. Um, uh, and uh, he then did, of course, on safe at any speed and started a lot of public interest movement. But this, this need to look at things in power and to watch closely is as fundamental to, to this country as any country in the world. And it has been with us literally for many, many years, centuries. What I think we're here tonight to talk about is how, how can it be preserved and sustained and, and actually emboldened. Um, I think there's nothing more important than standing up to power. And there's nothing more lonely or difficult than starting a news organization out of whole cloth from scratch. Uh, in my own case, I started, uh, I got fed up at 60 Minutes. They, they, uh, I had been Mike Wallace's producer for five years. My stories basically all led the show because it was Mike Wallace. <laughs> he did the investigative segments, and I was the investigative producer. And I had an instance or two where uh, there was an attempt to take someone's name out of the script uh, for reasons that had nothing to do with journalism. I can go deep on that if you'd like later. But I had a problem with that. 
and so I, I broke a four-year contract and quit literally the next day with a two-sentence letter. I faxed, I, I lived in Washington, I faxed it to the founder of Don Ewing. Uh, and I had no idea what I would do, but I did that old movie network, and mad as hell, I'm not going to take it anymore. That was yeah. sort of what was going on there. <laughs> and then uh, I had offers to work at other networks and other things like that, but I, I knew that they might have other issues there too. I could run into that. I've sort of encountered those things before. So um, anyway, I got two friends who didn't know each other because I had to be in complete control after what had happened. <laughs> I admit that candidly. Um, and so I, this is a really terrible thing. You should never do this, which I realized. Um, I was the executive director and the chair of the board. So I didn't, <laughs> I didn't want anybody telling me, you can't do this. And uh, finally, after 10 years, I felt secure enough <laughs> to relinquish the chairmanship, which if it was really bad, I, I shouldn't have done that. But, but, but anyway, the, the Santa Club Perry started doing the reports and studies. And uh, the first thing, the last story I did in 60 Minutes, which uh, was nominated for them, and I followed up on, we had one half of the White House trade officials going to work for foreign governments that we were negotiating against. At that time, our biggest trade was in Japan, and many of them were and top on their salaries and then Friday to Monday working for countries that were trying to get trade advantages and things like that. But, so I'll spare you the 300 reports and 14 books. We don't have to go through it. But I also want to talk about before, well, just to follow that up. So I, I did this out for 15 years, 14 books. We did the Biden the President series of books where we, um, we would actually have several dozen people looking at money going into presidential candidates and adding it up we had a, a speech here we call top the top ten career patrons that whoever you were electing as a candidate you should also realize you're going to elect a few other people too and they're going to be very close to the next president of the United States wouldn't it be nice before the election before any votes are passed in the answer and I would actually know actually know who is else, who else is coming <laughs> to, my, to the White House. Um, and so um, the last book, usually like when there's a sequel to a movie, it does worse, like worse and worse and worse, and kind of fades out. The third of those books, the No Four, was a bestseller, and it was kind of perplexing to me. It was the last thing I would have expected, to be honest with you. Those career patrons were syndicated by the New York Times and others, and the Associated Press, Washington Post, around the U.S. and even around the world. So there's something there. People wanted to know this before the election, not after the election. And we had a number of these cases where we would do something, people didn't know it, they'd be surprised, they would want more. And uh, it was like uh, the major media just wasn't doing any of these things. Uh, at the end of 15 years, and we also, of course, people don't like you when you do this work. You, you may have <laughs> probably had a sense of that. Uh, even at 60 Minutes, we had death threats which I'm happy to discuss if you'd like. But, uh, they're, they're not the world stories, but um, to me at least, I think because I remember them too clearly. But, um, but the biggest problem journalists had, even at 60 Minutes, was time. It wasn't being censored, actually. It was, you were supposed to do four investigative original, investigative stories a year. Well, that sounds, oh, four stories, what's the big, What's the big deal? Well, if you're going to film something and you're going to shoot 500 minutes of film and you're going to do a piece that's 12 to 14 minutes, uh, <laughs> doing that in two or three months is, would kill a team of horses. I mean, it's, it's almost impossible. Now it's six stories a year. You'll notice about 110, 60 minute stories every year. The number that are actually original investigations were 60 minutes has broken it themselves. I'm not trying to pick on them to be any of these shows. But it takes time and it costs money to develop that material, and it just does. So what are most, I, I'll, I'll never forget when I went to 60 Minutes, I heard this phrase, and I'm still marveled at it. And it was said with a straight face, which really bothers me still. And I said, uh, how, I looked at 150 stories, I wrote memos on 50 stories, and I went and looked into the possibility of 25 stories, three made air. <laughs> That's how difficult it was to find, uh, like uh, Juan Valdez, only the 
best coffee beans, you had to find <laughs> the best character, you had to find the best, you know what I mean? If you could interview dozens of people, you had to find one that would be the best for you. So anyway, that's TV, which has its own incumbences because of the medium. But, um, but with uh, the kind of reporting we did at the center was heavy, heavy, heavy document driven. Uh, Bob Woodward once said that no one used documents more than the center. We would have five or ten data sets, different data sets, court records, campaign contribution records, all expense paid trips for politicians, you name it, putting it all together, who are their friends, who, who, who should we know about, et cetera. That's just for those, but we did it with state legislatures with a first of both state legislator data for every state legislator in the United States, so you knew the same thing about them. Their financial disclosure, no one had ever put online, and some legislators were indignant that we were doing that, of course. Uh, and it didn't seem to be a problem for us. But, um, but anyway, the web is useful that way. You can use the web that way in ways you could never do it before. You could never have gone through 7,000 records. How would you send them out? So the web, the revolution that's good, <coughs> A lot of good things in technology is it makes it easier to tell those stories. Um, the one thing we did run into, uh, just to give you a flavor of this kind of work and how it's not normal, uh, uh, is we had uh, three, uh, I had several threat threatened lawsuits at, uh, at 60 minutes. I think two thirds of my stories were the threatened litigation. I'm not kidding. One guy actually wanted to strip CBS of its license to broadcast. I uh, hate when that happens. Um, it was dismissed. Uh, Mike Wiles and I were subpoenaed because they wanted to find out who our secret person in shadow was. And um, Mike and I, at that point, this is way back, this is in the 80s. We did the first SNL story in America, the biggest collapse of the financial institutions since the Depression. And we had a guy who had personally stolen $60 million, but he fingered his three other buddies who stole more each. And um, one of the, one of the, sorry to use simple language, one of the bad guys, one of the, who was getting prosecuted, 130 people went to prison. This guy was the mastermind. He wanted to find out who was that guy, because we, we discovered him with the skies and shot certain kind of ways just to try to keep him safer the guy. And um, they subpoenaed, and Mike and I slugged it back when we were using film still, and we called him Mr. X. Because Mike, I said, Mike, we can't tell CBS, not even CBS this, because we don't want to put CBS in an awkward spot. And if they know, they may feel obligated to tell. But, uh, and I was really the only one who really knew who it was anyway. Mike was just doing the question. I'm just kidding. But I mean, yeah, the producer does all the work. And, Mike was great, he was a very good <laughs> So anyway, we, the subpoena was quashed. We didn't have to give up that information, but you want to hear something scary? Mm -hmm. This guy had millions of dollars. That TV show Dallas, when they had the house across the water, it was his house, okay? Uh, he, had, he had a Rolls Royce limo that he picked Mike and I up. That is a guy was a piece of work. But anyway, um, he, they hired a, uh, a forensic pathologist, and they had three or four ideas of who it might be. And they, even though we had given them disguises to seem to make a person who did plan in the age, came in from LA, and I said, Whatever you do, don't make this guy look like an ape. And he said, Okay. And he made him, he looked, they gave him a totally different color of hair, different complexion, different, even bone structure. He tried everything to change the altered, the, 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 the pathologist guy figured it out. On the picture, yeah. And fortunately for me, two things happened. The first one was uh, the, the guy who was uh, decided to go public around that time because of that, which, but more importantly, he was not hurt in any way. They were all ended up in prison, basically, <laughs> including him, by the way, the source. But um, I'm just pointing these things out because it shows you the the difficulty of getting these kinds of stories. At the Center for Public Integrity, we did a story about Vice President Cheney and his uh, former company, Halliburton, that had gotten, uh, they were railing against the government, but they, Halliburton got a $450 million uh, Exim Bank loan from the government, which was slightly ironic, to me at least. I, I'm easily amused. Um, 
And um, we wanted to see what was going on. It was, uh, some people call that corporate welfare when you have U.S. government money going for a loan to do business with a company on the other side of planet Earth. Uh, I, I just do the facts here, but that, so, but that, there are some that think that. Anyway, so we, um, we started looking into that and uh, we, we did the story and uh, Dick Cheney had, if you recall, was the head of the, the uh, committee to find the vice president of Canada. He was the chair of that committee. <laughs> he found someone. Uh, <laughs> anyway, we published the story because they had gotten a four hundred fifty million dollar Exxon Bank loan, and they had a partner in Siberia, uh, Tumen Oil, which was owned by Alpha Bank, which is the largest bank in Russia, owned by oligarchs, billionaire oligarchs. And when we did our story, um, I got a call from A.P. Gump, one of the biggest law firms in the country, and their Washington office alone had six hundred. And uh, they said, we want you to take that story down immediately or we're going to sue you. And we had had 10 or 20 threats at that point. But actually, no one was suing. <laughs> These guys sued. So uh, it was uh, the biggest libel case in the United States in uh, a quarter century. Uh, our, so we had libel insurance, but we lost the insurance after this case. <laughs> Uh, and uh, we had to, uh, there were 20 depositions. I was deposed for two full days under the lights, with video and lights and all that stuff. And um, essentially, and the judge who was appointed had been appointed by George Bush. And uh, the story is about Cheney, and we're like, hey, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> this doesn't look good in terms of what's going to happen. And what happened was, uh, uh, it was dismissed after five years. But our side spent four million, their side spent eight to ten million dollars to get rid of that lawsuit. The reason I'm telling these stories, or this kind of a story, is to give you a flavor for the difficulty. Now, this is not your usual work. Most work is from public records. It's from what people in public like. That is to say, public figures, which means they can't sue. Maybe if they do, they won't win. It's not a commercial entry. Commercial interests have a much easier time of bringing lawsuits. That's a whole other conversation, but but uh, it's the fact. It is a fact. So um, so anyway, one of the issues is how long these things take. The investigation itself. This uh, lawsuit had 150,000 discovery documents, and just for one story. We didn't have that many documents to get our story. <laughs> but anyway, um, but I'm trying to give you a flavor because this work is. Uh, extremely time consuming, sometimes quite complex, and sometimes you can't even actually get the story. I mean, someone will decide not to tell it to you or, or um, other things like that. And so, so at, anyway, I, at some point, um, the center, I left the center to finish that out. I went up the center and I, uh, uh, I basically went over it eventually to, I did a fellowship with two different schools and then I ended up at American University. We have an investigative reporting workshop, I call it, and we do, we do frontline documentaries. We've just done our eighth one this week and uh, with that co-production and we do things with Washington Post where we have now 40 student violence in Washington Post. Uh, we hired a joint with a Pulitzer Prize winner, the Post couldn't hire and the night couldn't hire, and so we split it, which is very unusual. Uh, in fact, I think Happened before, and and um, anyway, New Yorker did something with us, Jane Marin, and, and we did. A, I had 28 students looking at a big, powerful company, and we went through the six or eight data sets. It took us two and a half years, uh, but this kind of work continues. In the case of this, there's 18 university-based reporting centers out of 100 nonprofits in the U.S. We're not that large, but we're the largest one in the only ones in D.C. But there are great groups all over this country now that have cropped up. Uh, cropped up is a strange term to use, but it is kind of that way. They've sprouted up. Uh, when I started the Center from the House in 1989, it was the second one in the U.S. First one was Center from the U.S. It started in 1977 by four unemployed journalists in California, uh, all of whom I know. And um, the Center from the was the second one, and now, as you've heard, there's a hundred of them. 
including this esteemed organization here we're talking discussing tonight. Uh, there, um, but you know, I think what convinced me more than anything, I have two political science degrees, and uh, I started out as a sports writer, working nights during college, and I always had a problem between what people said and what they did, and I know sort of a big gap <laughs> between those things. The, uh, but, but I think uh, I wanted to, the story that really got me, and from that day on, I knew that this work helps people and it's important, and I, I never looked back, was um, <clears throat> the first story I produced for 60 Minutes. We were um, uh, in uh, the southernmost county, southern, south central county in Tennessee called Clinton County, and I flew into Louisville, and then I uh, drove three hours to the southern part of the state, and I was investigating an allegedly corrupt school superintendent, which we'll hear more about in a second. And I was followed into the county line, I mean, the town line, sorry, it was all in Kentucky, literally because I had Jefferson County on my place, not Clinton County, and they had been tipped off, I guess, somehow, that I was coming, 60 Minutes was coming, it was back in 1960. Anyway, long story short, the uh, superintendent of schools had been taking the money for handicapped children, telling the children that they, their parents, that they were not entitled to go to school because they were handicapped, and pocketing the money. He was stealing the gasoline. He had sexually assaulted six women, and he had 23 relatives, Billy Bob and Jimmy Bob, I'm joking, but entirely <laughs> on the payroll, and no reporter. The Louisville Courier Journal had done a print story or two about it, but the TV had never come in and done this. I had to meet people behind trees at midnight, stuff like that, which was actually kind of fun. <laughs> but but uh, one guy, these two guys offered me, a, and there was a, a car looking for it. They knew I was out and about. They were trying to find my rental car. And um, I, uh, this guy, the first thing he wanted to know if, if I had, like, I needed some protection. So what do you mean? And he handed me a gun. And I said, I better not do that. I'll shoot my foot off. <laughs> and then and he said, well, you want some other fortification? And he had like a half pint of something. And I had to say yes to something. But, um, <laughs> but, but anyway, uh, so when we were getting ready to film, uh, Mike Wallace flew into New York, Lowell Berman, who's a somewhat well-known producer, played by Al Pacino, and the insider flew in from uh, California. And crew came in from I don't know where, two crews. And we had one shot of interviewing this guy, this uh, uh, Bob Colston, Robert Colston was his name. There was one meeting right before the election of the school board. And we knew that he, he declined our already that he would not do an interview, but if we showed up in a public meeting, the one he had to have right before the election, we might, just might, get a chance. The town was so small that the room was literally like a living room of a house. That was their school board meeting. This is a very poor town, et cetera. So we go in, and, um, if, and, and if he doesn't show up, guess who just spent tens of thousands of dollars? <laughs> you know, helicopter shots, two crews. <laughs> and um, thank God he comes out. And at one point, uh, not making this up, uh, Mike Wallace, who was really a spectacular interviewer, I worked with Ted Cobb and I did a little work with Barbara Waters. No one was in his league as an interviewer. He would, like, there was no one anywhere close. And he had never had some guy, an out of town guy, <laughs> but sitting there in front of him with the cameras asking him questions in his whole tenure as a public official. And he started asking them very uh, intense questions. One of them, is it true you have 23 relatives on the payroll? And he starts listing their names, Jimmy, Bob, and Bobby, and Joe, and all these. And he, I'm not making this up, he started chewing his tie. <laughs> and his face started turning red and perspiring heavily. And uh, uh, we aired the piece, and the next day he was fired by the governor and others. This was the um, this was the poorest and the worst county school system in the state of Kentucky. And Kentucky had been rated the worst in the United States. So it was arguably possibly the worst school system. 
The night before we filmed, we're at a motel. There was no motel there. We were in another county. And we're having dinner at this little uh, diner uh, place. And we're, um, we have three rooms. We're going to head up there afterwards. Mike had just flown in just before this dramatic filming. And the outcome I just told you. And we, um, Mike, everyone recognized Mike, of course. So someone comes up and taps him on the shoulder and says, uh, Mr. Wallace, uh, we'd like to, if you please come with me. And then they meant, she meant, this thing was a she, all three of us. We stop eating our dinner in the middle of dinner. We get up, we go to the back of the restaurant. There are 25 citizens from Clinton County who came to another town to tell what it's like living in that county. People crying, men talking about what had happened to them, their children, what had happened to them. And Mike had just arrived from New York. He read my memos, but it's one thing to read a memo, it's another thing to see people screaming and crying and freaking and having driven 20, 25 miles. We go up to our rooms that night, respective rooms, and um, there's a knock on the door. I forget whose door it might have been Mike's, I'm not sure. And it was a state trooper, and he said, uh, sir, uh, we have just gotten a death record. They asked all three of you to leave the media. And this is before the, the night before we were filming. We all talked, as they say, talked amongst ourselves. <laughs> and we decided it was bogus. We actually didn't believe it. And we thought it was a, a kind of a lame attempt to scare us. Uh, we could have been wrong there, but <laughs> <laughs> fortunately we weren't. And, you know, then the piece aired and that happened. But that, to me, showed that investigative reporting, this kind of journalism, holding those in power, kind of how valuable it is. There was a need for someone who was not them to come in and cover that. And we gathered facts about every dimension of this, not just this guy. I mean, we had a lot of material. But uh, the local press, guess what? He owned the local press. And 96% of all the economy in that county, the poorest or second poorest county in America, was federal money. So they would get all this federal education money into the school system. And of course, they would give them the business for the, the uh, printing press for the newspaper, but also to print all the school stuff. The school stuff alone got the paper of business in the town. And when I came to town, this guy, one of the people following me was the newspaper who had been told to do stories about 60 Minutes is coming to <laughs> Anyway, but all I'm trying to give a flavor here is this information is hard to get, but more importantly, it helps people. It actually helps those who don't have a, a news organization, but also those who don't have power to, for their stories to be seen and heard and felt and for the public, broadly speaking, to understand what the situation is. And to me, for me personally, obviously, uh, I don't think there's a higher calling. Uh, I can't think of anything that's more uh, exciting or important to do. It, it, does it mean it's easy? No. And it, is it normal? <laughs> Some of the stories I've told you are not the typical stories. Most stories are pretty basic, straightforward stories, but maybe no one else is covering them. 1,400 stories by this esteemed organization. Uh, we care about the public press in just a few years. It's an awesome number of stories using data now increasingly getting into all kinds of things. But the question to ask every, everyone should ask themselves is, if not for this organization, who is going to do this? Um, and so um, I, uh, I could talk to you about a hundred different things, and I, I could also talk for a couple weeks probably, and apologize, but it's probably true. Um, but I, I think questions and answers and discussion is probably more fun than somebody hearing. Um, I, uh, I have been involved in this new ecosystem that's been created. Um, there are also nonprofits outside the U.S. I mentioned a little earlier about the history of nonprofit journalism itself. It would be great if we had commercial outlets that wanted to do this themselves, as they have done. I worked at CBS in the 80s when uh, they fired 450 people. 25% of CBS went out the window. 28 bureaus around the world went down to five bureaus. Uh, why? Because Lawrence Tisch uh, wanted to make millions of dollars, and it's a long conversation which I'm happy to discuss. We actually did a story about Tisch. Uh, I can't resist. I'll, I'll tell that. Sorry, I'll tell that story, and I'll stop when we do questions. 
we did a story called Tobacco on Trial with over 97 premier law firms in America helping the tobacco industry stave off any civil litigation about smoking. And actually, you may or may not know, not a single lawsuit ever succeeded all the way to the U.S. Supreme Court. Why? Because in the uh, cigarette case, uh, you know, pack, it had that warning thing, and they said, therefore, the consumer should have known. Of course, that warning didn't go in there until whenever it was, the 70s or 80s, it wasn't in the 50s, 40s, 50s, but that didn't matter. So, um, anyway, this is, um, so we had the story about the lawyers and the ways that they were stating this all. We had a woman who was dying of lung cancer, and we had all the story putting together how it works, how they managed to do this, and the techniques and things they do to scare people. Uh, depositions are one or 20 days, which is legal, things like that, scares it's not illegal, but it's very, very hard. Do they have a right to do it legally? Yes, I guess they do. But we were trying to show all that. And at one point, one point we wanted to see who was behind the lawsuits, who was paying the lawyers. One of those companies was Lorillard, which was Tish's company. And at some point, my boss had dinner with Tish. Now, it so happens at that time in history, they'd already fired three or four hundred journalists, and Don, you and the founder of 60 Minutes, and Mike Wallace, at that point in time, this was 87, 88, hated Tish. They first thought he was another William Paley, and they started to realize he wasn't. <laughs> and, and they started, so what happens next is it may seem peculiar, but put it in that context, it makes more sense. Tish, according to Mike, we, we weren't there, my co-producer and I were not there, but Tish said to Mike uh, over dinner, probably smiling, uh, uh, Mike, I don't want you to do that story. And Mike claimed to us later, and I have a witness, and someone else wrote this, not just me. Mike said he told Tish to go to hell. Now, did he say go to hell, or he just kind of gave us shorthand? I don't know, but he refused to kill the piece. Now that's interesting since he owns the company. <laughs> We're at 60 minutes, and this is uh, 1988. But uh, we, we then said that Lawrence Tisch, the president of Laura uh, uh, but the president of CBS, CBS Incorporated, but also the president of Laura declined to comment. So fast forward a few weeks, he, he did decline to comment. We tried to get him to do an interview with the help. And um, a few weeks later, 60 Minutes is having the 20th anniversary of 60 Minutes at the Tower on Green, big fancy ice sculptures, all these corporate types that I didn't know their names, but I could tell they're very important. And you know, the producers are like, oh yeah, them. You know, but it was one of these lot of VIP New York things. And I, my MO on these things is to come and say goodbye pretty quick. But anyway, I'm in there. I don't know what to say to these people. Anyway, I'm in there, and Mike had an impish side, like a, like a horse went looking outside the barn, like a little bit of a mischievous look. And I knew when I'd seen that look. That means, oh my God, here we go. And he had this, like, he was excited about something. And I'm like, oh no, what is he? And he's looking at me, which is even more worse. And he says, he says, uh, I go, Mike, and he goes, hey, Larry, Larry, come here. There's someone I'd like you to meet. And I, I'm looking at Mike like I'm going to, you know. And, and he goes, Larry, this is Charles Lewis. He's the guy, who, you know, that helped me stick that story right up your ass. <laughs> <laughs> and, I, and I go, hello. <laughs> I'm blushing. He's blushing. Mike, of course, is in heaven. <laughs> he, that this made his day. <laughs> he saw two people squirm simultaneously. Um, so anyway, but uh, that said, uh, as you know, uh, three networks, uh, three, three TV shows, two networks had trouble telling that story. In the book that I did last year, I actually discussed in great detail what happened. There was one documentary where it was shot on four continents around the world, and uh, we exported tobacco. Uh, we actually, still, Obama's trade representative, first one, part of his cabinet, came from Philip Morris. We are still sending cigarettes overseas. And um, 
it, it's, it's fairly outrageous, in my view at least, it's killing people. There were 100 million people in the 20th century that died from smoking according to the World Health Organization. This century it will be a billion with a B. And so, uh, I just mention that because uh, it's, it's irritating, I guess. And you also had several news organizations that couldn't tell. That one about the four commons that half a million dollars was spent, I know the two producers, the day Philip Morris brought a $10 billion lawsuit against ABC for a tobacco story, and they later apologized for it, by the way, uh, the same exact day they killed the $500,000 documentary. Um, and I tell the story about how they killed that, and I actually went through Rue Norwich's uh, papers after, since he had died. Uh, and within two hours of the lawsuit being announced, there were 11, 11 lawyers in Bernardo's office, mostly from ABC Inc. And later that day, the producer was told they had a problem with his hour. He had just been approved about three days earlier. And uh, they, they shelved, and then when the, they asked for all their outtakes and all the notes, that's when the producer knew it was over and any leaked information that it had been spiked to the print press. But anyway, so this is a con this is not a simple thing. That's the report. It's never boring. I will tell you that. But the need for this work couldn't be greater, and the abuses of power don't exactly stop. Uh, humans are involved. Money is often involved, and most of it, much of it, is not in plain view. Usually, and we are so proud of our transparency laws. Um, a lot of those laws are very difficult to enforce. So my center was the, were the ones who posted all the Iraq and Afghanistan war contracts. Um, uh, within six months of the invasion of Iraq, we disclosed that Albert had by far gotten the most money in the contracts. No one had ever done it, but the web was newer. that had just come into being, and we had 73 freedom of information requests and 20 people working on the clock for six months. That's what it takes for this, these kinds of journalists to get the efforts. But it's, it doesn't matter where it is or who's doing it. I'm really trying to make the point that getting to the truth of any issue is hard. It takes time, and therefore, it costs money. <laughs> and, and so um, what you're trying to do here is about the most noble and important thing I can imagine. And it's not like abuse of the power only in Washington. Uh, uh, or any other state capital, they're everywhere. So I'll stop there and I'm happy to take questions. I probably went too long as it is, Brian. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs>
So I, I hate to say this, I mean, I'm hoping I'm wrong, and yes, that needs to be improved and these up. Uh, I, I, I'm not holding my breath, to be honest with you. I don't mean to sound deep down and cynical, but on that one, it should be done. It, um, very good chance it won't be. There's too many people that don't want it to happen and walk into Washington. Uh, sadly, sorry. Did you have another one? Here? Yeah, another one. And um, I want to preface it by saying that even though Angie doesn't look like it, she's an old school newspaper person. <laughs> and I fall in the same category. Um, so we come from a media environment where we were trained to think of local media as being pretty competitive. Mm -hmm. uh, among our different outlets, TV outlets, newspapers, radio. We all wanted to scoop each other. We all thought we were in economic competition. Uh, but I feel like that's melting away a bit for us in that we are increasingly open to collaboration, particularly at Carolina Public Press. We'll work with anyone if, if your work is up to snuff and you can help us tell local and regional stories. I'm wondering if you're seeing that as an increasingly prevalent trend um, not just among nonprofit media, but other media. Uh, I am. Uh, and I think there's a really interesting thing going on here. The, the window down, as we said, the commercial press uh, has fewer journalists. So they have these empty cavernous newsrooms, uh, those that still have newsrooms, because 250 plus newspapers died completely in America. But um, so they have empty newsrooms, fewer people, one third fewer, roughly. And they need content. They, they, you know, there's, in cities like Philadelphia, today there's half as many reporters covering uh, the issues and abuses of power in Philadelphia as, as in the 80s, 30 years ago. That's true in almost every major city in the US. Uh, and so you have a situation where collaboration makes sense. I mean, meanwhile, the scrappy nonprofits, the new nonprofits, the, uh, the wonderful Painting and the you know what that have cropped up to track this in power. They have a problem. They have content. They're doing great stuff, but they need eyeballs. And so there's a natural confluence for the anemic, empty, cavernous commercial newsroom to partner in many cases with with the uh, new uh, you know startup, upstart, whatever you want to call them, <laughs> news organizations. And that is happening uh, quite a bit. From the nonprofit standpoint, you're, you're, you're massively increasing your eyeballs uh, on anything you've done, and everyone wants additional impact. They just do. Now, um, so I think, I mean, that's sort of been our model. My, my little investigative reporting workshop, our budget is a million, uh, the Center for Public Integrity by comparison is a 10 million annual budget. So it's, it's a smaller type of approach than I had before. But we, we partnered with the New York Times on paper. They wanted to just take it and cite us, and we wouldn't do it. And they had to cite us, give us a joint byline, and mention the workshop and the story. Um, with Frontline, we've done eight documentaries with them, uh, co-produced in our offices. Uh, I mentioned the New Yorker earlier, I think. Uh, we did something with them where we've done all this work. And yes, we were going to do all of our stories and all of our data sets and all of our cool, fancy stuff on the web including posting 89 nonprofit front groups that had happy sounding names that weren't anything but happy. Uh, and so, uh, but that's nice, but it was on a website, and here's one of the premier magazines in America with the reporter that's well regarded being mayor, and so that was a no-brainer to me that we would do that. So I think collaborations are actually smart at this point. At least, I mean, it could be to a point, I mean, everyone's done things. ProPublica, of course, is large. Started, I, I used to say they were born on third base because they started with 30 million. Um, and, uh, and they've done great work. By, you know, they've won two full surprises. Uh, but they, they've partnered from day one with the New York Times and Washington Post and some of the leading outlets. I, I think that, I don't know why one would not do that, honestly. So I think it's important to do it. And that actually brings up all kinds of interesting things. We don't have to go down this road, but think what that really means. Does that mean that we're heading towards a world of de facto syndication? Where the part, I think it is absolutely what's happening. You know what, I'm not sure it's bad. 
And I think it, that that's what it is, it's what it is. Uh, information is power, and having it is important, and the more people that know it, the better. Welcome to democracy. So I think, uh, and I think funders I've dealt with, I've now raised a fair amount of money over the years. I am a wealth man guy, I'm not a big fancy money guy, but actually we've raised about almost 40 million. We, my, my colleagues and I, uh, in 25 years. Uh, and foundations and, and individual donors like what I just said because they want it to be relevant. Uh, and uh, the more eyeballs something gets seen, I have to also tell you, there's a, I actually tracked this with the Center for Voluntarist History itself. The first 10 years, as the center became better known, and its work was quoted and used more often, uh, people were more excited about the center. And as the public profile of the center rose, so too did the, our budget, annual budget. People started wanting to support it. So I think that's a good thing. Yeah, sorry, here. Um, here I just have a question. You piqued my curiosity of when you refer to this administration. So do you think, having lived through the administrations, this particular administration is repressive of and antagonistic to the journalistic community, more so than prior administrations? Uh, can everyone hear that question? The uh, um, question is, do I think that uh, this administration is more repressive to journalists than prior administrations? Um, the consensus among journalists is uh, yes, and the reason is the, the national security intelligence rationales for the prosecution of the sources and the fact that they wanted their prosecutors to do this and to squeeze the guy who exposed domestic surveillance, Jim Risen, was squeezed for six years and what, you know, at the same time the public's finding out all these things that we didn't know, and it's important to know that stuff. So I think there is a sense now, under Bush, George W. Bush, there were 60 federal subpoenas issued against reporters. There was no pick for them either. And then, of course, the all-time worst president, for the most part, was generally regarded to have been Nixon, and, uh, with two to 300 subpoenas brought against the TV networks alone in the first term of Richard Nixon. So you have to pick, what did, what did we hate more? The pressure financially and otherwise by an administration against the owners, which was a part of what was happening with Nixon, or uh, subpoenaing and actually trying to prosecute journalists themselves, which was Bush, or uh, the Obama uh, one where he's very supportive of journalism and democracy, but meanwhile is putting the sources in prison. <laughs> I, I find all of them kind of frustrating, <laughs> and uh, so I don't need to make light of it. It's a very serious problem, and it's hard to say which is worse. I find all of it uh, uh, outrageous, actually. I, I'm not objective on that, that one, I have to say, uh, in the back of the way. Yes, sir. Um, you mentioned about the syndication, and you said you weren't sure that was a bad thing. Do you have anything to offer to consumers of uh, investigative journalism? Um, the multiplicity of sources is, seems to, you know, Facebook is now uh, right. posting stories from several places. Seymour Hersh is able to publish in London Review of books, but he's not able to publish in the New Yorker. Who do you believe? And so for those of us who are not journalists, how do we, how do we sort through the, the chaos? That's a great question. Did everyone hear that question? Yes. Okay. Um, it's a problem. I mean, <laughs> There has been a splintering of information, a diffusion of outlets. And of course, with the web now, with three or more billion people now have access to the web, 60% um, or more of the world gets their information from mobile phones. Uh, and, uh, you know, it, 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 there's a problem here with information in general and how the wheat chaff problem. We have massive amounts of information, hundreds and hundreds of websites or blogs that are mostly baloney. I mean, they're useless, they're opinion, they're bloviating, they have no substance, and, and or they're actually malicious in nature. Uh, and the public somehow, uh, which has never probably studied or thought a whole lot about media literacy, uh, has to decide what is legitimate and what isn't. I think it's a really serious problem. And, you know, phrases like media accountability didn't even start in the English language until around the 80s. 
we started realizing we needed to be aware of what was happening in the media, but also recognize the media's own faults and foibles. To your, to your question, I think it's, it's a real problem, honestly. There's a, there is an information problem where most Americans, well, my opening chapter of my book that came out of, of last year is that uh, at the end of, uh, or in early 05, 60% of the American people still thought there were weapons of mass destruction in Iraq, even though George W. Bush said they weren't there and hadn't found them. People still clung to their beliefs. And most of them were getting their news, I'm putting news in quotes, with the likes of Rush Limbaugh. I, I have to tell you that there was a poll about who is a journalist and who isn't that Pew did. And an equal number of Americans said Rush Limbaugh is a journalist as Bob Woodward. Uh, and you know, that, that's 10 years ago. But that, to me, is revealing on a whole lot of levels about information. Um, we have a public that is not well, I know in 96, 40% of the Americans didn't know, American people did not know who the Vice President of the United States was. So we know we have an ignorance, a, a dumbing down problem. But part of that is a lack of media consumption altogether when it comes to news, mostly entertainment probably. Uh, and so, and I mentioned, I think, earlier about sound bites going from 40 plus seconds down to five or six seconds. What can you say that's intelligent in five seconds? I mean, think about that. I mean, Oh, yeah. <laughs> That's good. Yes, yeah, as a person what who has done this for many years. <laughs> yeah. um, what are your top three news? This is a double question, so you can't get away with just half of it. What you are your top tough. three news sites? Where news do you sites. think the best news comes from? <laughs> are you talking about national news or international news? National news. Uh, well, I don't know if everyone will agree with me. It's my own opinion. Um, I think in terms of uh, I, I tell my students to, uh, to basically read the New York Times and the Washington Post for the two best papers. The reason I say it, they also have won the two highest number of Pulitzer Prizes. For magazines, I tell them to read the New Yorker and the Economist. Uh, but it, and I, there, there's different shows you could recommend. I actually, despite my frustration with 60 Minutes, thanks to 60 Minutes and uh, CBS Sunday Morning are high quality commercial television programs, and of course, yes, Frontline and a number of offerings on PBS, but not enough of this kind of uh, aggressive. What do you think? Are you are those the websites? I mean, what about well, they all have websites. Well, no, no, I, I, they all have websites. Oh, but, no, I know they do. Yeah, I know. Um, I, are they less popular than Well, I, I'm, um, I don't want to sound like a traditionalist, because obviously I'm not exactly a traditionalist, yeah. but um, I know that one of these groups, has still 1,200 reporters all over planet Earth, and I know that many of those websites don't, <laughs> shall we say. And I have a certain amount of time every day, and I, 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 it doesn't mean I don't go to some of those sites. I find, um, I, I'm interested in specialized things. The best national security information in America is actually the National Security Archive, which has used the Freedom Information Act more than any other single organization since that act was enacted in 1966. They have published 75 books. They are the ones that went to court during Iran-Contra insisting that emails were public records. I know those people and I love them. They're great. 30 years, that's a quality organization. So yes, do I look at NGOs, you know, non-government organizations and decide who the high quality people are? Yeah, I do. Do I know almost all of them? I do. Some of them my friends, yes, as a matter of fact. Uh, um, so those are groups I have more respect for. The other ones, I'm not into bloviating. If you're like opinion by itself with no facts, I, I have no patience for it. I don't know what's wrong with that. I'm getting old, I think. There's something going on there. But uh, I don't know if that answered uh, your question. But, oh, yeah. yeah. Um, and the second part of the question is there have been prosecutions under the Obama administration, but none have been successful as far as I know. Do you think possibly he's trying to set the bar where prosecutions against journalists are not going to happen, considering the people he's put on the Supreme Court? Well, you know, the sources have been prosecuted. About they've seven, been prosecuted, but not yeah. convicted. No, they have been convicted. They're serving time. Six or eight of the eight that regular nine. I mean, a lot of them have been convicted, and some are in prison, seriously. You're, you're talking about the journalists. The journalists have not been prosecuted. Their sources have been prosecuted. Yeah, their sources. 
Uh, but that's a cutesy, to me that's a two-step, a cutesy way. We're not prosecuting the journalists, we're just prosecuting their sources. But it's because uh, the journalists flipped on the source. Uh, well, or didn't flip, but they figured it out. Let's be honest, this is a dirty little secret. No one ever talks about it, okay? You ready? This is for real. Uh, if you're a national reporter like Jim Risen, how are you going to interview someone? If you go to the government agency, they have cameras. If you meet the source, you have to fill out a register at the front desk. Uh, uh, there is a general, and if you have a cell phone, there's a GPS tracking device in the phone. If you drive a car, there's a tracking device in the car. Uh, if you, there are thousands of cameras in Washington, D.C. So how do you even meet a source? Think about that a minute. It is really, really, really hard. And so you can do it. You've got to go somewhere, some other city, triangulate. Yeah, but it's very cumbersome and it's very, very difficult. And that's why we only have about 20 national security reporters in a country of 320 million people. Uh, so that reporting is actually the most difficult single type of reporting because the records are almost non-existent and they prosecute your sources. Uh, and that's not the only reason. That it costs money to have a person like Jim Risen watching and publishing three articles a year because it takes that long, maybe he does five, and he's a good guy. I just mean that before it takes longer to do. So this is a problem with these kinds of stories. So, sorry, I'm going to jump around, but that's a great question. Over here and then back, we're both here. Okay, start there, yeah. So you mentioned your students and helping them get bylines in the Washington Post, which is excellent. Um, but I think about them graduating perhaps with hefty student loans and then going to do a job that may not Um, well, I can't control the world here, but uh, <laughs> I, I try to encourage them, to, if they want, to go into journalism, no one's holding a gun to their head. And we have had, um, I would say, four to six, I don't know the exact number of our students are now working for the Washington Post in their newsroom full-time as employees. We have former employees at TV networks, at magazines, uh, various types of well-regarded magazines. Uh, it, but do many of them not get jobs, or it, that, that's also true? I'm not going to say everything works perfectly. My job as a professor is to train them, or as the executive editor of my news organization, we've had 80 paid interns in six years and done 60 investigative stories in six years. Um, I don't know what percentage of them went into journalism, and actually not all of them wanted to be journalists necessarily. But we do the best we can here. You know, I can't, uh, this is not cradle to grave care uh, for <laughs> their occupational uh, success. I mean, I'd like to have that, but it hasn't quite gotten to that point. So it's a, it's a reasonable question, but I think some of them are. The really good ones shine, and they get hired. I mean, I, that's my experience. Uh, at least many times that's happened. Uh, there were two questions. Well, uh, we'll come back to you, but over here, you're next, yeah. Investigative reporting could be used maliciously and destructively also. What kind of safeguards do you have against that kind of thing? That's me. Um, well, you know, you don't have a safeguard against an individual reporter doing what he or she wants to do, or a person who says they're a reporter, but they're really not, but they, and we're in the First Amendment, you know? We're, we're hoisted on our own guitar. <laughs> On that one. Um, I think part of the problem, part of what happens is uh, you do have civil lawsuits that can be brought if it's a private company or a private individual, it's not a public figure. That happens. Sometimes all that is needed in that case, if it is a malicious person and they're not really even a journalist, you'll see um, them either retract or, um, or they'll fight it and win or lose in a courtroom setting. Uh, but it is a problem. The blogging, there's a lot of irresponsible blogging, frankly, and uh, that's a problem. There, there are millions of bloggers out there. Um, not a, many of them make money from their blogging, but uh, very few, I think, still. But um, most people don't pursue that in terms of litigation or something like that. We have the First Amendment that protects their right to, to do things that are irresponsible, generally speaking, unless unless they've done something to classify records or there's some law that they've broken. 
So that's a problem. I mean, it's particularly a problem uh, for, I think, for the blogosphere personally. I think that's the biggest problem. The other problem is outside this country, uh, there are very serious problems. Uh, um, hundred, I was saying earlier, 158 of 168 countries have criminal libel laws where they take all your money and put you in prison. They don't like what you wrote. Maybe you were malicious because you were writing about the president of the country, but you were actually correct. <laughs> and there will be very serious repercussions uh, overseas. Uh, the U.S. journalists are pampered a lot by comparison. I was in an investigative reporting conference in Moscow a year after the attempted coup with Yeltsin in 1992, all these iconic journals from planet Earth. And um, Rahana Russo from South Africa had seen her sources murdered in the streets. Uh, Maria uh, uh, Duzon from Mena uh, Duzon from Colombia had seen her sister blown up in an apartment. They were trying to kill her, and her sister was visiting. Uh, and she had to flee for her life and live in Spain. Uh, journalists in Britain and India had been accused of violating the Official Secrets Act and actually put in prison or jail. Um, and several of the former Soviet journalists were published, and it just had happened. It was playing out right then. They had all had colleagues murdered. Uh, and the U.S. journalists raised their hand and said, well, and they said, how are things in the U.S.? And one of them said, well, we have a hard time getting our Freedom of Information Act request back. <laughs> <laughs> And uh, so, you know, uh, everything is relevant, I guess. <laughs> uh, there was a question here, or here, or here. I saw one or two others in the back. Oh, okay. There's someone over here that had their hand. Yeah, maybe not. Uh, okay. Uh, yeah, or, uh, yeah, okay. Yeah. Since you're an expert with lawyers. Well, I don't know if I'm an expert. <laughs> Chuck, can you repeat the question? Yeah. Basically, what is my advice about Freedom of Information Act and how to use it? Uh, how, how can a journalist anywhere figure that out or deal with it and go from there? Uh, I have a second question. Oh, uh, okay. Well, I'll, to answer that one, we have several organizations, as you probably well know, the Society of Professional Journalists, the largest membership organization in the U.S., um, but others that have uh, guidelines on how to follow a Freedom of Information Act request. The problem we have in our society is most FOIAs are filed by companies trying to find out information about other companies. Most journalists don't file FOIAs because they're on deadline, they figure it'll take too long. My advice to all journalists who file is sue. Go to court. No, we were told not to, uh, we were told that Halliburton would not release, allow, they urged they urge the Defense Department not to release the information about contracts that had been given to them, including Kellogg, Brown, and Root, for the State Department and the Department of Defense. We said that's outrageous, and we went to federal court, and before it went, kept going, they didn't want the bad publicity, and they caved, and we got the documents, and we posted all of them that revealed Halliburton had gotten more than twice as much money as any other of the top 50 companies. Uh, and so that was a case of pushing and getting. Do you know I mean? And I've a few times, not every time, but a few times, it works. And I think a lot of journalists should stick with going after it, even if they think the story's over. Don't let up because you might get lucky. <laughs> it's worth it. I think people think you're not going to bother or you're not going to worry. I just got a FOIA request about the Russian mafia, uh, sorry, the Russian billionaire lawsuit, <laughs> and it took five years. And the Clinton. Clinton Presidential Library just sent me, I had to pay for it, uh, about four to five hundred pages of secret, well, it was secret, uh, documents from inside the Treasury and National Security Council. I haven't read it yet, but I can't wait. Uh, it's waiting for me back home. Uh, <laughs> so I, I urge, go, appeal every time, if you can. If you, if you want to take the time, I think it's important that we push this because <laughs> It's information we have a right to, and we should do that if we can. I know it's easier said than done, but 
Oh, yeah. Do you do your plants in like sequence? Do you start with a smaller one and then build? Because I, I just know from my own experience, I've heard different journalists tell me, don't do a huge plant and then build on that. Do you start with a small one? What is your best practice? It's hard, to, it's hard to give a f flat answer. I, I once was investigating the very first Senate re report. I was investigating all the U.S. trade officials over 20 years. It was great fun. And um, so I'm at the trade office, and I'm finding out that the U.S. trade rep has two relatives, a daughter and a husband, who's lobbying her agency while she's the U.S. trade representative. And she didn't think there was a conflict of interest. Don't get me started. And so I wanted all of the uh, personal uh, financial disclosure forms for all of the top officials above a certain pay grade. And, um, uh, and the guy wouldn't give it to me. He was being squirrely. And finally, I said, well, then I'm going to have to file a freedom of information request. And he goes, and he, he was later the chief of staff to President George W. Bush. But at that time, he was just a PI, just the general counsel of this agency. And I, I, he knew I was mad and had gotten to me. Uh, it doesn't take much. But, um, and and um, he said, well, you can file a, a freedom of information request, but I could just give it to you. And I'm like, you little, you know, fill in the blank. But I got him. I, I got it. But, but all I'm saying is push, push, push. You can never push too hard, in my view. Uh, sorry, question here and back. You actually were first. Can I go here and there and there? OK, sorry. Yeah. While I very much uh, admire uh, the nonprofit paradigm uh, for investigative journalism because of the necessity of having this work done, uh, mm -hmm. and as you had already referenced, uh, the economic decline of traditional forms of journalism, right. um, I'm skeptical about its sustainability. Um, right. uh, and my question is, uh, Chuck, um, as uh, a, is there any formal research into economically sustainable models as alternatives being done? Uh, and as a corollary to that, um, what is, if there is, the most successful model that is extant at this time? Um, that's a great, sorry, it's a great question. Um, I mentioned some that have been around 150 years but you're probably not counting the Associated Press and some of those groups. They're all nonprofit journals and models. I think there almost certainly is happens, but when I was at Harvard doing research, I did a thing called The Growing Importance of Nonprofit Journalism in 2007. And it was the first long story. We found only 10 articles in the United States ever about nonprofit journalism because it, it was never looked at closely because it was not the commercial journalism. Therefore, it must not matter. Uh, and so uh, what I'm getting at is, I think it's an absolutely reasonable question, but my favorite anecdote back at what you just asked is, uh, in the 80s and 90s when I was getting into this unusual place, uh, uh, world, and people would say to me, my friends in the commercial realm, they'd say, so what is this thing you're doing, the center for what? And you know, they would ask me all these questions and they'd say, uh, it's just a kind of an unusual business model, it's sort of like you're, you're like a, in an antiseptic kind of a cocoon type thing. It's a very unusual model. I don't understand it. And I'd say, well, what's your model? And they said, we have a great model. We have advertising. And I'm, now, and now I haven't had a chance to go back to each one of them and play that back to them. But now they're not quite so keen on advertising. It didn't work out so well. That's a long conversation, as you well know, because it involves media owners being exceptionally greedy taking profit margins that were multiple times larger than other sectors in the economy, and then not investing in research and development, and not even remotely seeing the web coming, and allowing someone with 19 people known as Craigslist to clean their clock with classified ads. So uh, a lot of what occurred here, I'm not persuaded it couldn't have been avoided to some extent if the commercial media, they went through a six, 1965 to 95, most of the American media, namely newspapers, went public. What does that mean? It meant that they started having out-of-town investors worrying about their quarterly earnings, and it changed the whole dynamic. They also started merging with each other, and suddenly the way to merge is you merge with another paper, and hell, we don't need all those reporters. Why don't we cut it in half? So you reduce the number of reporters, but you increase the profits. 
So they were milking it. They were trying to a term. I heard up at Harvard, I was very amused by this, I'm easily amused. Uh, it, they called it harvesting your investment. And I'm like, ooh. That, and it's harvesting your mature investment, meaning it might be there now, but it's not going to be there forever. So get everything you can now. Part of what happened in the commercial realm, this story has still not been told fully, is what the commercial media did to itself. I actually am persuaded it could have been avoided. I heard that one of the Pulitzer folks, this is unofficial, of course, but uh, actually was socking uh, large sums of money at thousands and thousands, maybe hundreds of thousands of bills, dollar bill, or you know, cash in his bathtub. Uh, one of the, the Pulitzer family people, and as you know, they they sold the St. Louis Post Dispatch and got out of the newspaper and all together with the, one of the iconic newspaper families of all time. So that, there's another story to this, which is not the one you asked. <laughs> sorry. There was a question. Yes, here. Sorry. Well, well, my question is about the, <laughs> sorry. About the consumer of right. journalism. Uh, and the consumer's interests, uh, attention span, uh, whatever. Uh, it seems like public schools are talking about a concept called critical teaching, critical thinking. It's a good idea. How far have we got? I don't know how well I don't know how well we've gotten with critical thinking. I agree with you, but it was heartening to me after 9/11 that NPR doubled its audience. From 9/11 and the following 10 years, it went up to 30 million people in a given week watching. I mean, uh, listening to NPR. Now you could just say we have a lot worse traffic. I'm just kidding. Uh, they're all in their cars. I'm just kidding. I would have a perverse sense of humor, but. Um, but I actually think there was a hungering for news in that period. Something happened. People wanted serious news. Why is NPR popular? They actually don't do very much investigative reporting. And actually, a dirty little secret is they fired the last three investigative editors. I know because they asked me recently to be that. They've asked me twice. And I kept saying, why would I work there? You keep firing your investigative editor. <laughs> and they have people that do good work there. Daniel Swordling is the obvious case of fantastic work. But uh, everyone in, who's dealt with television or broadcasting knows the real power is not with the suits who run the overall thing. It's the executive producers who control the air. And can you imagine being one uh, timid soul going around and begging for someone to help on a story that sounds really investigative and fun, and the executive producer looking at you like you're from Neptune? I'm going to give up my best person to you for a week? Are you kidding me? And so you're cajoling people to do great journalism. Part of the that's a different thing off your question. I know what you're saying. Is there a need for more critical thinking in schools? There is no question of that. I don't dispute that remotely. I, I'm just... You've got to train your readers, I suppose. Well, we do have to. It's a sad commentary, but we do. I, I, I don't disagree. I think you're right, we do. It, I didn't mean to sidestep it. Uh, I don't know the answer to that. How, we, how do we do that? Fortunately, not fortunately, I just I haven't had time to think about that one. <laughs> it's clearly a huge problem. We are entertained to death? Well, we are. Yeah, Neil Postman, yes, absolutely, amusing ourselves to death, I do think. And he wrote that in the 80s. That's right. <laughs> What's really disturbing is he said that 30 years ago. That's right. And what in the world would he say today? He didn't um, like television either. Yeah, right. <laughs> and poor guy would really be upset. Yeah, I know. I would really be upset if he could see. There was a question I thought was starting to stir here or here, maybe not, or over here. Okay. I feel like Monty Hall. Do we want? No, no, okay. I live in uh, the criminal justice world uh, myself, and I'm, I've been watching with interest the, the nonprofit uh, Marshall Project. Oh, yeah, me is, too. I, they just are amazing. Um, and it's, it's a national, but, but concentrated on one issue of right. related to the criminal justice problem. So, um, is that sort of thing happening in other areas where it's not geographic so much as yeah, it's, it is. It's a great it's a great question. Of the 100 nonprofits, there are some that do that. Marshall Project, as you know, is brand new, a hedge fund guy, um, worth God knows how much money. Uh, basically hired Bill Keller, the former executive editor of the New York Times. Now, the idea that the former executive editor of the New York Times, who I know a little bit, would leave the New York Times and go to work for a nonprofit, to me, that's a sign. Obviously, I would notice that. But um, I think that's notable. If, if he didn't think there was something happening in that space, he wouldn't do it for just because 
times uh, people are not known for their adventuresome spirit, generally speaking, especially after they leave the Times. <laughs> and so uh, that's happening. The Pulitzer Center, run by John Sawyer, who's done reporting in 80 or 100 countries uh, when he was at, uh, the foreign editor of the uh, Pulitzer's paper, the St. Louis Post-Dispatch. They do inter international reporting, hiring freelancers on planet Earth, only international reporting. There's a Connecticut nonprofit, I forget the name off the top of my head, but it's in Connecticut. And they, they and a couple of other groups have a beat tracking health issues, just health. Uh, there was one out at USC, Annenberg uh, School had a separate nonprofit doing just health. So you, you do see some cases of specialization. It's not the norm. Usually it's a geographically based, it's in a state, it's in a city, uh, or something like that, but it, it is happening on some level. And, and I think that's going to happen more and more, and I actually think it ought to happen more and more, to develop beat coverage. Uh, in, in the case of the Marshall Project, you're gonna, you have something in a realm of 10 to 20 people full-time investigating criminal justice issues in America. Guess how many people at the New York Times probably track that? Probably one or two. But my favorite example, and it, uh, it's a mischievous example, which won't surprise you, but um, if you go to the New York Times and try to find a, a reporter covering human rights on planet Earth, you might find one. The other phenomenon we haven't talked about in the nonprofit sphere is the rise of the NGOs, the non-government organizations. The organization that has more information about human rights, research and reporting, and even television production and everything, is Human Rights Watch. They have 400 people in 19 cities in the world. Um, about one or 100 or 150 at least of those people are former, quote unquote, former journalists, who by the way are functioning as journalists in that realm. I wrote about that a year or two ago in an article called The Rise of the NGOs. Um, and that's interesting. Um, uh, I created a group called Global Integrity that tracks corruption around the world, country by country, and does 300 questions about every society, same indices for all countries. And anyone scoring it has to be based in that country. And um, that's a case where it's specialized and they hire hundreds of freelance reporters to help do the scoring and to write articles about it uh, on that subject in those countries. Not Americans saying what's happening there, what they think is happening. So there's all kinds of neat permutations now that are happening. I think it's actually very exciting. Um, so um, this is not, uh, this is anything but uh, stuck in one year right now. It's quite fluid, quite the opposite. So other questions, there was one, yeah, here, here and then here, yeah, sorry. With the crying need to inform people, why do commercial television news organizations spend so much time devoted to anniversaries? <laughs> I, I don't get that. They get to use footage from last year or <laughs> <laughs> They're amortizing their investment. No, I'm not sure that's entirely wrong. Is sure. it a cash cow for them? Well, if, if, if they don't have to do additional new footage, you know, there's a phenomenon in Columbia Journal Review has written about this. Most international coverage now, CNN and many others, is no longer with original produced material. It is people happy talk in the studio discussing the issues. Why? Because that's cheaper than going out in the field and filming. And so anniversary stuff means you get to recut the old stuff and change the date. I'm being a little bit flip, but I'm not sure that's entirely wrong. Uh, I'm not defending it, I, I have a problem with that too, but that, that you may have seen six, uh, CNN did a whole multi-hour series on the 60s, taking the stock footage uh, from everywhere that they weren't even around in the 60s, that's the amusing part of that. But you why why did the that. media need to beat an issue to death over and over again? <laughs> uh, because I'm not defending them, I'm just explaining, like the Malaysian uh, crash with CNN. That's because it had a spike in ratings. Those cable shows in particular live and die on how hot the story is. And the longer they can extend the life of that story, especially if, if it's happening in a news vacuum where there's not a whole lot of other things occurring simultaneously, that would naturally distract them. And they part of it. This Philadelphia thing right now is obviously a huge story. And of course you would all be doing Philadelphia. Lester Holt flying in a helicopter. Who knew he could fly 
uh, over Philadelphia <laughs> the night of, you know, and so they'll do that. But, but normally, they'll, they, they'll, they milk stuff. We all know that they do that. Now, they'll milk it as long as they can. There's a news vacuum, and there's no other amazing thing for weeks. They'll pound it into the center of the earth if they can, you know. It's just the way it works. It's just life. I, I don't like it either. <laughs> there was a question back here. Yeah, I'm sorry. Yeah, um, I kind of want to piggyback off the critical thinking question because I think there's this assumption that we're doing these great investigative pieces and no one's reading them. What's wrong with our readers for not paying attention to what we're doing, right? But I also think that part of that comes from a lack of sort of maintenance of that channel of here's this thing and here are our readers. How do we like? How do we make that connection? So I'm kind of wondering whose responsibility in a news organization do you think it is to create and maintain that relationship, and who is doing it well? Because if we have to be writing illustrated picture books to get the word out about what's happening, I mean, that's what we should be doing, right? Well, no, it's well put. I, it, this is a great question, and it's similar to some related questions. Um, I'm, I'm not objective on this. I am an old-fashioned guy, and I think that if you have serious high-quality, new information of public importance, it should and often, depending on what the story is, will get noticed. Um, and I, I've just seen too many cases where that has happened. And, and so I'm, I'm sort of, uh, uh, I, I will always cling to that belief. I'm not saying it always happens. <laughs> but I, I believe that there's the potential for that. And I've seen too many cases where that has happened because it has a lot to do with the timing of the story, what else is happening in the world, will it resonate, will it not resonate, who's saying it, where they come from, what else is happening in the news. I mean, there's all these factors that you cannot remotely predict. We did the buying of the Congress book, 36 researchers, writers, editors. The Speaker of the House, Luke Gingrich, announced it prior to its publication. I mean, generally, that would be a fantastic thing, right? This is before we even release it. We have 60 reporters at the National Press Club. It seems like we're golden, right? It's going to get massive coverage. Two years of knocking ourselves out. The most extensive book ever written investigating Congress, to my knowledge. And there's been 4,000 plus. Within three hours of that moment, Kenneth Starr released the Monica Lewinsky report. And we went from Mount Everest to fill in the blank. <laughs> <laughs> and no one covered that. The book was irrelevant. The timing of everything. I, I guess what I'm trying to say is there are these vagaries of, of, of the unpredictability of life itself, and the news cycle has also got issues like that. And there's also stories where the press doesn't want to cover itself. We found that the media was taking uh, Federal Communication Commission, people that regulate the media, on $2,500 expense paid trips, and the number one destination was Las Vegas, that bastion of media policy. <laughs> yeah, I'm joking. Um, and um, uh, ABC wanted to do it. Some actually uh, honest, uh, straight ahead kind of reporter, well known guy who moved over to CBS. He meant well. He did a segment. They sent it up to New York, to ABC. And then, 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 you know, World of Tonight people. Jennings was still the actor back then. I don't want to curse here. I feel really bad that this is a bad word. Here. But I also want to be active, of course. <laughs> but anyway, I'm just going to say what was said. This person calls up. It's within the hour of the broadcast. They had commissioned it originally properly because they didn't know what it was about. I'm just kidding. I don't know. And the uh, executive producer said to the well-known correspondent, I'm sorry, I'm just quoting here. Are you out of your fucking mind? <laughs> they killed the second instantly. For just like that. So that's another really censorship thing. But what I'm saying is, you can never tell these things. I, I've had 35 news conferences uh, at the press club, and I've had three people come, and I've had 80, 80. Uh, and, and knowing who's going to show up and who's going to do a story, you never, you can never quite exactly be sure. <laughs> and it's like the vagaries of the media itself and trying to capture what that is or ascribe any logic to it, by the way. I, I would not recommend that. I'm sorry to give that kind of an answer, but these things have a lot to do with personalities. We broke the Lincoln bedroom scandal. Who knew the executive producer slept over in the Lincoln bedroom and didn't want to do the story, funny thing. Uh, 
Uh, <laughs> that was the same network you could see. But we gave it to CBS and they did it, so it was okay. But um, anyway, uh, any other questions? Uh, sorry. One more question, yeah. Happens to be one. Easy question lately. I spent a lot of time in my car trying to sort out some podcasts. You had answered your question earlier about sources of news. Are there any podcasts out there that you think are good from an investigative reporting perspective? It's a great question. I, you know, I'm, I, I have one of the three people apparently in America that did not do the serial thing. I mean, some of the podcasts, I'm sorry, I've been really busy. But, uh, but the, uh, the, the podcast thing is actually very exciting right now. And, um, uh, the, the oldest nonprofit doing investigative reporting in the U.S., the Center for Investigative Reporting, has begun a project called uh, Reveal. And they're doing it with NPR's uh, stations. I think it's American Public Media, but it ends up on all the N NPR stations nationwide. And all the nonprofits, not all the nonprofits, many of the hundred nonprofits, including my investigative reporting workshop last week, have co-produced material with them where they you know, dig out all the documents, do all the records, and then they do the podcast from it, but they also have a website that illustrates all the stuff with photos and graphics and other things. And these podcasts, because people spend so much time in their cars, among other things, and also just ha having a good story that has good characters and it's engrossing, and maybe it's also important, uh, what an added bonus. <laughs> uh, people are drawn to that. I think that the audio form is, is going through something really creative and exciting actually right now. Uh, and so th the nice thing about this subject is there's hope occasionally and you do see glimmers of a pulse uh, in the public and you see that people actually, that's a case of hungering for good stuff. If someone did that much work and they're asked to tell a really good story with characters that took a lot of time, it costs money, and some people out there get it and they love it. There's evidence of that. So if one, before we completely occasionally despair, we should recognize occasionally quality is rewarded with great receptivity by the public. And, and that is, I think, what gets all of us through the day. We may not be always able to predict when that is, but the fact that it happens is about the most thrilling thing. When we posted the Patriot II Act against the wishes of the Attorney General of the United States, whose top aide told us we'd be sorry, and there were 350,000 unique visitors, 15 million hits, and 100 page one news stories the next day in the U.S., including the New York Times and Washington Post, and that law was never brought forward, that was kind of cool. And uh, that was made up for all the times we did stuff that no one noticed. <laughs> Once in a while you get lucky, and, it, and if the timing's good, the material's amazing, it's real, they can see it, they can almost feel it, and it, it connects. And when it connects, and you get that level of going viral kind of thing, this is back before people even used that phrase, this, the internet was around, the web was a few years old, but I've been in that situation and boy, that's like the greatest high you guys as a journalist ever had. The world has seen it, they're excited, they're angry, they're engaged, they demand something. Guess what, that law was never brought forward. And no one was more upset than the Republican chair of the two committees in the House and Senate because the Speaker of the House and the Vice President had not mentioned it to the chairs of the committees. I said their egos were damaged, poor babies. Um, but uh, anyway, welcome to the real world. <laughs> so um, anyway, uh, we could probably talk for a week here, and I guess it's uh, time to uh, say goodnight here, or for me at least. Thank you.